Welcome to the Living Artist Podcast. I'm your host, Preston M. Smith. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Living Artist Podcast. I'm Preston M. Smith at PMS Artwork Everywhere on Internet Land and Socials. I want to thank you for landing on this podcast. Whether you're a professional artist, just getting started in the art world, a collector of art, or just consider yourself a creative person, this podcast has something for you. I like to think of it as a fun way to rant and talk to other creative people about living the life of an artist, surviving and getting ahead in the art world, and enjoying your life. But most importantly, not waiting until you're dead to make it happen. All right, let's get started. Tim, how are you? This meeting is being recorded. <laughs> this meeting is being recorded. So get all your fox and shits out now. <laughs> that's my that's my normal <laughs> vernacular, dude. I'm not going to get them out. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> they are welcome here. Okay. So how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing very well. I love your uh, your background there. This okay. is going to be audio, but I like to be able to see who I'm talking that's to from time to time. No worries. You're my you're in my office of wonders. Yeah, I recognize a couple of those pieces behind you from my research. And then is that uh, Mick Jagger? That's Mick Jagger. That's the um, not live. The, that's a cover of Interview Magazine that one of my producers in New York, uh, an old producer who's passed since, used to be one of Andy Warhol's buddies and and did a lot of the uh, covers for Interview Magazine. And oh, cool. He gave me a bunch of prints over the years. I got a Warhol. I got one of his pictures of Warhol, which I think was the first cover of an interview magazine. And then I have this Mick Jagger one and a couple other ones. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, it's cool. cool. I, love, well, I love them. I got to print it myself. That, that's what was so cool. That's what I like about it. It's like he gave me the, the negative and then let me print it myself. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's, so it's, a really just, nice, it's a really nice print. Um, you could just mass produce those. <laughs> I could, but I mean, that's not the, that's not the, I, I'm not, that's not the, that's not know, the goal. Yeah. Yeah. I'm that, totally, that's I'm totally a, that's a, this is something to cherish. And, 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 it, and it's funny because we always joked about like the, the kind of the somewhat BS of the sign limited edition, you know, like, right. Such a, you know, because people like artists print shit on like different papers and they make a new edition and it's like, you know, like it's just so convoluted and, he signed that nine and three quarters out of 10. That's I love, really by the way, it's, that's really cool. Well, thanks for coming on the show, first of all. And I wanted that you sparked my uh, interest on talking about prints because I saw one of your articles in Forbes about print collecting. We're going to get to that. I wanted to start with how are you doing? How have you been uh, coming out of the pandemic? How is your work affected by the pandemic? All that. Let's just jump right into it. <laughs> Um, well, thanks for asking. I, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of people struggling right now. Um, it's a very, very Definitely. weird time. I think for me, it's been very difficult. Uh, the pandemic has been very difficult. You know, I, I spent, I spent a career building momentum, mm-hmm. uh, and, and developing a workflow and a process and a team, um, and human beings around that i saw regularly and, and collaborated with regularly. And then all of a sudden all that changed. And then it started up again and then it stopped again. You know what right. I mean? Like tease. And you know, I got I got going cranking last summer in June and July. And it was like, okay, that you know, that little spell is behind us and I can get, get going again. And I started working again. And then all of a sudden, like the pandemic reared its ugly head and like by you know, November it was all shut down again until you know, February really in March. Oh yeah. And yeah. so, you know, it was, and it was very stressful and I lost my father in the process and, and, um, Oh, wow. I'm sorry to hear that process and terrible, you know, COVID experience. So for me, it's been, it's been a big change and I, and I've changed, you know, my business, someone that worked for me for seven years and was very close to me is no longer working with us. And so that was a big change. And so, yeah, it's, it's been super disruptive and, I think it's taken its toll on me as an artist and as a creator and, and um, working my way to start a new chapter through it. You know, like, I think that like, 
I was trying to like go back to life before it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't think I'll ever, I don't think that's ever going to happen. I think it's like, okay, what's my, what's the future look like for me and how is it different? And I also think that for me, it's recognizing how quickly life can change and really deciding like how I want to spend the rest of my days. And that is a trans I'm in a transitional period, I think uh, in that capacity. And so, um, defining my next three to five years and what those goals are and how do I work towards those goals? Cause that that's ultimately going to decide what the next, however much time I have left, you know, is going to look like. And I think, uh, I think I've done my duty of selling people shit that they don't need for long enough. Right. Yeah, that's true. Well, it does definitely put everything into perspective. First of all, I'm really sorry to hear about your father. Thank you. That's horrible. I know a lot of people lost people, during this time, uh, I was lucky not to. I mean, I had some friends of friends and stuff that who, who passed, but that's horrible. Did you find that, well, I mean, everybody's kind of picking up the pieces right now. Are you going to be picking up those pieces and then directly filtering them into your work? Or are you going to kind of use your art as a distraction coming out of this? Um, I think, I don't think art is a distraction um, as much as it is a purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think that you can't take, I don't think the artist can separate the human experience from the art. I agree. And so for me, undoubtedly that will come out of it. Like right now I'm working on uh, um, this thing with butterflies and like, I don't know why I fucking chose butterflies in <laughs> contemporary art, but it was like, when you think about the butterfly you know, you think about a rebirth and a new generation and a transformation. And maybe that's why all of a sudden I was like, oh, this would look cool with a butterfly mm -hmm. or with butterflies. And maybe that's where I am. Maybe that's the birth. And maybe that's because that is that iconic symbol of, of transformation that I'm doing a project with that, you know, yeah. and, and, and as cliche as it, as it is, like never underestimate the value of a well-executed cliche. <laughs> I completely agree with that. Right. So, you know, and, and, and people can hate all they want, but that's, that's just kind of where, that's where inspiration awoke at that moment in time. And so I think there's a little bit of that in there, but I think that's, got, that's not a major project. It's just something I'm creating because I constantly create, you know, I think, mm -hmm. I think you look at like an artist studio, you know, and I'm different you know, like a painter has like thousands of canvases all over their studio and like half finished and quarter finished and never finished and finished, but never seen yeah. projects. And, you know, in my space, it's, it's hard drives and desktops of computers and, you know, bits and bytes on raids that are, that are projects that are in the creative process at some stage or another. And it's just, mm -hmm. you know, I just finished a project that I shot in October finally found how it went together, you know, yes. and I must have opened those files a hundred times before I finally was like, Oh, this is, this is the message that, that this is what, this is why I created this. And I didn't realize it until now. Oh, you know? nice. So it so needed that, to percolate a little bit. Yeah. It's never, I mean, it's, it's sometimes it's very linear, like thought execution result. Other mm -hmm. times it's thought execution paralysis <laughs> yeah, right right um, and then that insecurity of like sharing it because you're not sure if it's any good you know like oh yeah because as an artist you create great work and you create average work and you create shit work mm -hmm. right but it's the same artist yeah right my wife would argue with you there she's always like even the things i think are shit she's like you know what keep them somebody's gonna love them and, and unlike you, I kind of, I don't have a lot of unfinished stuff, but I'll have finished things that just kind of change shape a little bit. Like I will add to them and alter them a bit until I'm happy with them. But yeah, I, I completely right. agree with you. A hundred percent. But, but, you know, look like just for audience purposes, you know, like, mm -hmm. and I don't think you can be a great artist if you don't appreciate the masters and some of the greats. Right. And, oh know, yeah. I, I, I've seen a few great documentaries about Picasso and read a few books and inspired by Picasso because of his lack of writing one theme 
for a career. There's many artists who ride one theme for a career, right? Oh, they definitely. And in one style and that's their career. And he just got bored with styles. And some of his things that he did are not good at all. And I some agree. of the things he did are unbelievably transforming, right? Yes. But he's still inspiring all throughout, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's for me, not saying I'm like Picasso, but I can align with that understanding that I get bored with producing the same thing because I'm a seeker and I'm seeking vision through, you know, like different styles. You oh, know yeah. I mean? And I also, you know, like you put, was it Van Gogh that said that his rival, he felt like he was, he was, um, he was painting in his ear. Um, you know, like he felt like, he felt like, I forget the name of the, the other artist, but he, he just felt like that person was copying his style and like he was working in his head. And I think when you create something that is like inspirational, then, then other artists like with lack of vision, like just copy it or execute around it. And, you know, and, and, and that frustrates me and, it, and, and I get bored with it and I move on to something else because I think that the, the really good artists, they have really strong vision, right? And they mm-hmm. can transform themselves because it's not about the individual execution, but it's about the vision of inspiration that the other things that they do are just as inspiring and they might look different stylistically or compositionally, but they have the same awe inspiring, breathtaking gasp when people see them because they are truly powerful visionaries. Well, yeah. And they're filtered through that artist's experience. So like I complete, you're preaching to the choir here. One of my little sub themes of this podcast is follow your inspiration. Don't get pigeonholed. Don't get put into a box. Like I started out my first 15 years, of my career were nothing but figurative pieces, figurative pop surrealist pieces. And then I just made a 180 on abstract because that's what I was feeling. That's what I at heart. I was an abstract artist and I was playing with it in the background of some of the pieces. And I just followed that thread and that's what I've been doing. But I also have little, you know, chasms that come out of that too but it's all about keeping yourself inspired so i completely agree with what you're saying um i wanted to say preach when you were saying <laughs> it, but i didn't want i didn't want to interrupt you well i wanted to ask you about your origin story a little bit um i always ask everybody about that and how you got into art you can start as early as you want take as long as you want um i might interrupt you if you're if you catch me on something that i don't want to miss yeah, yeah go for it i mean I think like you can wind back the way back machine, you know, and, 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 and I wasn't, and I was never one of those, Oh, he's very creative kind of kids where like you thought like uh, that, that, you know, like there's always those guys that like, like my daughter's one of those creatives from the core, like the moment she was born, she was like putting together things in, in such a creative manner and a creative problem solver. Right. Um, and she and, was reassembling her crib. Yeah. And a hundred percent. And she, and she was like, you know, she'd walk out of her room at like five years old with like the iPad and like this sketch (laughs) that was just like off the charts. And I'm like, I didn't even know you could draw on the iPad. She's like, yeah, I found a YouTube video and she's like five and it's beautiful. And you're just like, uh, okay. Like I was never that kid. My most enjoyment in anything I did in school was our always art. It was always art class. That was the only thing I enjoyed in school, looking forward to school. But I didn't go to a creative school. I went to a very like prep school that was very valued, like lawyers and doctors and, you know, those business stockbrokers over creatives. You know yeah, what I mean? So it was like, the art, the, well, that was what well, I was passionate about. It wasn't like seen as like, oh, you could be an artist, right? It was something right. like you take art, you're like, you know, you're on the non-physics track, so to speak. Right. Like, yes. um, So, you know, I loved creating in that capacity and I loved the print, right. I loved like hanging something on a wall and having Mm -hmm. people see it. That was for me the best, no matter what it was like, ah, there it is that I made that out of my imagination, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, was always like the thing, but it wasn't, it wasn't rewarded as a potential future. And I never really was encouraged in that capacity. And, Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I went on to college and played football in college and that's not a very creative spirit of people, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and not a very fostering community in that capacity for just out of curiosity. What position did you play? 
I played tight end and I was huge. I was massive and I'm six foot seven and I'm a big dude. I thought so, you might've been uh, tall. Yeah. Um, so I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a large figure, you know, but at 50 years, 49 years old, I'm, I'm thin these days. But it wasn't until I was 27 years old. I was a high school teacher for five years. Um, I taught mathematics. My degree is in mathematics, so not in art. You know, when I went to college, it wasn't I put away my artistic side and focused on other things just because that was like, you know, make money, figure out your life. I became a teacher and eventually found photography as a storytelling expressive narrative and Mm -hmm. through that i started you know having art shows of my photography because back then there was no instagram there was no social media kind of things that and so if you wanted to share your work you had to put it up in public spaces right Right. that was like the very first take a picture make a print hang it on the wall share your art you know, and you're talking uh, old school film at this point. Oh yeah, for yeah. sure. Old school yeah. film, print it, you know, print it, um, yep. hang it. The printing process was is every bit as much as part of the photography process. Yes. Uh, and so that was my exposure. And, um, but that ultimately was like, okay, that's one way of having a career, but I was very attracted to, journalism and storytelling at the time. And so I went into the journalistic side of the universe and became a journalist and got a degree, a master's degree in visual communication, mm-hmm. with, which was journalism. And went and I worked as a journalist telling stories with my camera. And so that the artist side of hanging prints on the wall kind of, kind of disappeared into, you know, eventually into a 15 year career as a, as a commercial advertising photographer that, you know, I transitioned from journalism into telling stories for brands. But all along, it was like the dissatisfaction with creating this content that, that li- for me, only lived in the computer. Because as a commercial advertising photographer, you create a file and then you send it off to the, uh, the agency and they make billboards and bus things. And like, you never really make that process tangible into a print. Right. Right. And you don't want to, you don't want to hang that shit on your walls. Right. Like that's Although not, now they are a little bit with NFTs, not hanging them on the wall, but they're becoming something that people are collecting a bit, the sports, you know, NFTs. Yeah. I, th- and that's a whole nother. I don't even want to get into it. I'm sorry. Yeah, I brought it up. It's a whole nother <laughs> thing that, that, that I'm, that's a, that's a future. I think that's as equivalent as like digital, photography over film right it's like we're at that transition point where the purists are like oh it'll never be art and then the futurists are like dude like a print on the wall what good is that i'm not gonna have a print on my wall i'm gonna have a screen on my wall yeah exactly like so we're at that point like i'm gonna own a piece of this art you know it's almost like emerging of art and the stock market or something i don't know yeah it's 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 so it's It's wild but, but the art market has always been a market of um, speculation. Sure. And, and, there, and But what, what bothers me about NFTs, and not to side drill this conversation, is that there are a lot of non-artists, mm-hmm. right? Like profiteering from art. Oh, know, yeah. You, like that have no business in that conversation because they have no track record. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, they haven't paid their dues. Well, but did, did, like, are, are the, if you don't have a track record, do you have a track future? Right. <laughs> right. Like, right. Like, are you social gonna, media, though? I mean, there's a lot that? of people on social media. It's the same thing that are just coming on. They just started. I was talking to man one about this. I have created two pieces, uh, two illustrations. I'm an artist. Check out my art, you know, profile on Instagram. And right. where's the track record there? Same right. thing. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Um, but that's that's part of our fake it to you make it culture in, in social media these days, sure. right? Like it's like everybody is like flexing, mm-hmm. you know. Truth is truth, right? And you cannot you cannot discount truth because the people that understand and have value will will always be able to recognize a true artist and recognize a true creator. And, hey. and a true creator will always create. And those other people, when the next when F it, when when some other you know thing becomes vogue, they'll jump on that as well. Like, and that that's always the case. Like for me, that's noise. And for me, my big struggle is like creating work that inspires people 
to think and moves people with the power of the image. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the the best thing in the world for me is like when someone sees my work for the first time and I'm there present to watch them see a print on a wall and they gasp. Yeah. Yeah. And they literally like, (gasps) and that feeling is like the most rewarding thing for me as a creator is to like, understand that something in my imagination was put through production, made into reality, hung on a wall and moved somebody to the point of breathlessness. Yes. And now you've become part of their experience. They will remember that. And it's affecting them on some way, whether that's subconsciously or consciously or both. Yeah. And, and, and it was, it wasn't until I went to one of like the, big art fairs that my work was being displayed at that I actually went and was present and was like there watching this take place that I was like, Oh, this is legit. This is like, all right. Like, you know, I always wanted to, to make art that was powerful and meaningful and seeing people's reaction to it changed everything for me and made me say like, made the realization that my future is art on walls as opposed to art for brands. Yes. Uh, you know what I mean? Like that's the future for me. Um, and now it's real, you know, and, um, and that's where I'm dedicating my future energies towards. That's awesome. Was that art Basil, by the way? The first time I, I this series behind me, like the first time I created this series not to hang on the wall, but I created it just because I needed it to be created like visually. And then, mm-hmm. a, and then an art gallerist saw it when I put it on the, on the web and contacted me and said, Hey, I have an open wall at art Basel. Like I, do you want to put it on the, in my booth, I'll get it printed and I'll take care of everything. I just think it's really great. And I want to oh, wow. put it up, put it up there. And I, and this was like, I, I'll never forget. This was like November 9th. Mm-hmm. of 2017 and like our Basel is like December 2nd and I was like I don't even know if there's enough time to do it and he's like right. I'll take care of it all like don't worry about it so so I did it and um and I was like okay great like with no thought and um and we sold a bunch of pieces and you know it was a really eye-opening experience because he kept sending me pictures of like this booth just completely packed with people all like taking pictures and staring and like looking and like, Oh wow, this is great. This is unbelievable. And then I turned the series from like six pictures into like 25 pictures, you know, and I went in our shop more and I, you know, went, I was like, all right, this concept is really moving people. Let's, let's really thoroughly kind of explore this. And so I just like then developed it and then continued at doing the art fair scene of like Art Basel and like Freeze and and um, New York Art Fair and mm-hmm. and did you know one in Vegas, San Diego. There was a there was a you know there was an art fair here that you know that just like did that circuit. Yeah. Uh, and then and then what that really did was like expose my work to gallerists, and then mm-hmm. gallerists would be like, hey, I w- would contact me after seeing my work at the art fairs and be like, hey, can I? put my stuff, your stuff up in my gallery. And then that went from like, you know, one gallery to two to four to five to, you know, international. And then COVID hit. Oh man. Right. And you have all this momentum built up and you're just like, and my biggest, you know, I'd invested in, in, um, in in a lot of space at Art Basel, the, you know, in December of 2019. Yeah. um, And things were, popping and it was great you know and 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 opportunities were happening it was amazing you know and and i had a relationship with with um you know great gallery in south america a great gallery in in um in paris a great gallery in where in south america um in brazil oh nice um, and in rio and Mm -hmm. and sao paulo and um and all this connections and people i met at our boss was great and then it stopped right the you know the art fair stopped and the gallery stopped and all the momentum stopped and yes during that time i i connected with avant gallery in new york city and miami and mm-hmm. i don't know i don't know if you're familiar with dimitri and the owner of avant but it's got this really great gallery just the of name Avant-Gallery. of the gallery i know yeah yeah and and i i visited that gallery in october in new york city in october 2019 and i was like 
this would be a gr this would be a perfect curation and a perfect alignment for my work. Mm -hmm. So during COVID, I uh, had one of my team members reach out to them because I was like, you know, like let's start thinking about the future here. So I aligned with Avant and entered an exclusive agreement with Avant, and had that relationship has been amazing. And we have the art is like I think we've we've moved so many pieces and, and so many new collectors and so many uh, opportunities from it. And um, it's been, it's been a great relationship and it, it was a big risk because going exclusive and calling yeah. other galleries and, you know, that was a huge risk, but I really believed in his model of what he was trying to do is, is um, he's put, he's put, was putting these galleries in like really high profile malls, mm -hmm. right? But not like your mall, mall, but like like next to Louis Vuitton and Gucci and Prada and like the Rolex store, you know. And he had this great. Not like the old Thomas Kincaid shop. No, in every like mall. That. <laughs> no, like no, but but bringing contemporary art as a product, just like you know, a Prada piece or a, a Louis Vuitton, like just yeah. thinking about it more of like an accessory mm -hmm. to a to a lifestyle. And I think that is perfect for my art, right? Of what what it is is it's definitely truly like this these pieces that accessorize a space, you know, and it just align with them, and that and that's been really great, and um, and we're doing lots of things together and and moving new things, and so that really kind of became the evolution from like, all right, now here's my future and what I'm doing future. I'm still doing you know commercial advertising work, but I'm focusing my energy of creating towards the art projects. And, and, um, and so that's where, that's what I've been working on. I was going to ask you, that's cool. I, I was going to ask you if you were still doing a little bit of commercial photography and also I'm interested in the commercial uh, photography background. And I think you did some directing as well, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Did, Sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was going to say, did you, I'm assuming you still were honing your craft while you were doing that. Maybe it was, maybe your heart wasn't in it a hundred percent as far as like it is with your fine art, but as far as getting the lighting, getting the composition, getting all that, uh, honing your craft, I'm sure you learned a lot from working a lot as a commercial photographer. Oh my God. Like the amount, it's almost unfair really, like how much experience and production and how much my studio was able to produce mm -hmm. over the years that's a big struggle for a lot of artists is, is being able to produce and, yeah. and also just having the technical skills to problem solve. And like when you're doing, you know, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of images and, and, you know, 50, 60 campaigns a year for like the biggest brands and telling yeah. the biggest brand stories, you learn everything you need to know about execution. Right. And you learn, you have to deliver too. Yeah. I mean, there's no, there is no fail, right? Like right. people lose their jobs if you fail, right? Yes. Like, with, without a doubt, I can say affirmatively, like any shoot that was a failure that I executed, somebody definitely lost their job. Right. Mm -hmm. And I took mm -hmm. that a hundred percent seriously because they're, these campaigns are massive and they're like, everything has got to be perfect, right? Towards mm -hmm. execution. Now, the idea that you're executing might not be perfect. But yeah, I can damn well guarantee that what I execute is perfect to that idea. And being able to do that, it takes a lot of skill. And that transfers really powerfully into my artwork because I'm able to execute. I'm able to execute on a very high level. Now, whether or not that execution aligns with the nuanced form of expression of what I want to say mm -hmm. is not necessarily always internally easy to affirm of course yeah that and, makes sense and you know the, i think it was robert hughes that said that said that that um you know the artist's reward is you know you know putting your life and soul into the work uh, only to be left with determining whether it is any good or not right <laughs> well right? yeah that's not up you to know? you really 100 percent. right yeah but it is up to you before you publish it, right? Yes. You know what I mean? And that's Definitely. the struggle of the creative is that there is so much work that I created and executed perfectly, but it doesn't mean that I feel it is as good or worthy to be shared as some of my other work. 
And if it is, then if it's not, then it could be just a distraction from a powerful message that I'm trying to put forth as an artist. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and especially as an emerging artist, like, you know, I'm very much an emerging artist, right? Like in this space, like in the commercial advertising space, like I don't think there's many people who don't know my name, mm -hmm. but in this space, a hundred percent, I'm starting out, right? Yeah. I'm an emerging artist, right? Well, like you're I doing have... very well starting out. <laughs> you're getting a lot of attention with your, what is it? Black is a color. Uh, Black is a color. Yeah. Wonderful. And you're getting a lot of press. I love the, it's interesting because you said while you're exclusive with Avant Gallery, it kind of seems like they have a business model that is almost like it has a, it has a, a lot of reach. So it's almost like you're having multiple galleries that's rep that are representing you. They're just, they're covering a lot of ground. Yeah. I, I think with, without a doubt, I think that that that's a very good point. I, I do not want to discount the, um, the amazing partner I have with my marketing team um, and, mm -hmm. my, and Lindsay who works for me internally has done an amazing job of sharing the work. Right. Yes. You know, because like, I think if you, I think if the reality of it is, is that if nobody sees it, does it even exist? Right. right. <laughs> and, and I think a lot of artists struggle with that. They have great work, but it's not going to, it's not going to speak to, to, it's not going to publish itself. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and so therefore it could be the best, most, it could be the Mona Lisa, but if no one sees it, it does not exist. Doesn't matter. You know? Yeah. And mm -hmm. you know, if a tree falls in the forest, doesn't make any noise. You know what I mean? And, and that's very true. And, and I feel that the work is every bit as powerful as any work that exists out there. And therefore I'm going, going to share it with as many people who will, who will want to see it. And I think that's important. That's part of being a good artist is getting your work seen, right? Not only oh, yeah. imagery on paper, but it's really like sharing it and getting it out there. And that's, that's really important. I, I believe in the work. I think it's really good work. Um, the work that you see now, the work that yeah. you don't see, <laughs> I'm not so sure. <laughs> right, right. Well, there's a reason I don't see it, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, like we can't, we as artists can't be afraid to fail. Definitely not. Well, and I love that idea. I mean, I'm talking about that all the time, you know, just embracing the business side of the art world and maybe not even the business side, but the visibility side of the art world, because I struggled with that for 10, 12 years. I, I was just creating art. I was getting it into some galleries, some pop-up shows, but I was really not getting that much exposure. And I was like of the mindset, well, somebody will see my genius and get it out there for me. Well, how are they going to see your genius if they can't find your work? So you have to get it out there. I, I completely agree with that. Yeah. And, and, and uh, you've got to be unbashful about it. Look, like the great part about art is not everybody likes it. Right. Like, <laughs> right. right. Like not everybody likes it. That's, that's great. Like I can't tell you walking through art Basel, right. Like walking through the main convention hall, right. Like how much work I absolutely loathe. Yeah. Right? And yeah. I'm like, this moves me not, mm -hmm. but there's plenty of people that it moves much, which is yeah. great. You know, we, we, you, you walk through the universe and you see pe what people wear and that just shows you, that us, our human brain has so many different signals that send to people about what's good, right? Definitely. Walk down the street in New York, right? What's good, right? Like people think they look great. Other people think they look great, like, but not all of them can possibly look great to no. you. <laughs> and also it's your taste. I mean, your taste is kind of developed by your experience. You know, right. I, I mean, I've, I know for me, I've developed so much just doing the podcast, getting my art out there, working with different shows, curating shows. I've developed a much broader perspective on the art that I like now. Yeah. And I think that's been wonderful for me, but how many people actually have that, you know, that ability to do that? I mean, why would they, if you're just working a normal job and you're not exposed to it, then yeah, maybe your taste is going to be a little more limited. Right. And, and, you know, look, like there's, like just because a lot of people like it also does not make it good, right? <laughs> right. right. Like like yep. you know like you go to I, you can go to like those um, you know eighty nine dollar art canvas websites and like mm -hmm. there's a lot of art that probably sell tons of stuff you know and a lot of people like it you know but the depth of it is shallow and you know that's one thing when you take talk back to like you know 
my experience of, in, in the advertising space is like, I've worked with a lot of brilliant people, right? And I've learned a lot of brilliant things and, and a lot of brilliant artists end up working in that space as creative directors or art directors or brand directors, because it's, it's, let's just face it. It's like very rewarding financially business, right? Yeah, it's lucrative. Like, yeah. It's lucrative, yeah. Right. So that attracts a, a lot of talent. And I've learned a lot of the ability to add depth and layering to my storytelling through that. Right. Mm. And, and I can tell complex, I can tell really complex stories with really simple techniques. That's right? awesome. Yeah. That's that's power, right? And it's, I'm sure it was developed a little bit by working with constraints of being on 100%. a job. Yeah, like oh, you have you have to convey this message. You have this 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 amount of time, this amount of space, whatever uh, to yeah. do it. Yeah, so constraints are are key. Like I find that even with me as an artist, like having limited finances, to, you know, to get materials that kind of sparked me to find objects to work with, to take right. objects from the streets of Los Angeles. Now that's kind of a signature style of mine, which, you know, you can use the constraints or you can just bitch about not being able to do what you want to do. I don't know. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. A hundred percent. And, and like, you know, a good mantra is someone said is like, you know, how long did it take you to take that picture? Right. You know, it took a fraction of a second in 20 years of experience. Right? Yes. Like, yes. You know, and and that in in and of itself is is overlooked. I might be an emerging artist, but like I'm an artist with 20 years of experience creating on a very 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 high level. Yes. Um, and and at that, like the art itself is is layered with communication that moves people in its simplicity. Right. I think the most powerful work is the work that is simple and elegant and clean mm -hmm. um, that, and that, and that's my aesthetic, right? So that's why I choose that aesthetic because it is to me um, less is more. Right. And you've definitely achieved that. Like I love that. And I think those years of experience doing the commercial photography and honing your craft kind of made it, it almost like primed you for this experience of showing your work in Art Basel, having these galleries respond, all of a sudden, I mean, it's kind of like the 20 year overnight success story, right? All of a sudden 100%. you're blown up, you know, but no, people don't see the stuff that happens behind the scenes. A hundred percent. That's, that's what I was getting to by that. It's not an overnight success story. It's like grinding. Um, yeah. and, and then, and then also making really good decisions, you know, mm -hmm. but having that business experience to know when to leave a gallery or galleries or a partnership because of like, Oh, I, yeah, this, this is not going to work. Yeah, <laughs> right. This, right. And, and a lot of people's careers end there, right? Mm -hmm. um, when they can't see the, they can't read the tea leaves, right? And that's also part of it is like the success in this business is, is being a captain of a ship through a reef. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and if you can't navigate with precision and, and intelligence, like you're going to be shipwrecked. Definitely. And, and that is something that, when I started in this, I knew that going in, like I'd done my research and I'd done my, my due diligence and understood that like, while these people think they're playing me, I might just be playing them. Yeah, that's smart. Well, and the other side of, of that story too is you could end up sticking with a bad experience and just trying, oh, like, cause you're afraid, you don't know what else to do. You don't know how to pivot. You don't know how to adapt. And you get stuck right. doing that for the next 10, 15 years and you don't go anywhere. Right. A hundred percent. And, yeah. and, and financial freedom, like one thing that like having financial resources to make decisions and n not based on the pro the empty promises of people who are promising riches. Um, right. You know what I mean? Cause yeah. a lot of dollars could promise you riches um, and not necessarily deliver, but you're putting a lot of investment into creating work to hang in those galleries and then you're screwed. Yeah. Because let's face it, like the pictures cost money to make, mm -hmm. right? And the, and the investment to, to hang on walls and Bart Basel and things like that is real. And the um, time and investment as well. A hundred percent. So yeah. um, being able to pivot has been, has been helpful as well. I mean, I, I think, I think that's, I don't know. I, I, the, the one thing is like, I am all inspired by being at shows and going to galleries. And it is still my favorite thing to do. When I go somewhere, I mm -hmm. seek out the galleries that are there and I go and I experience them because to me, like 
that's the that's what I look for when I travel. It's like, where are the galleries? What are they? Where, where can I go see? What can I go um, experience? How can I be inspired by the art that's on the wall? So I'm still like, still just enamored with the the market and the and the people in the market and the artists in the market. Definitely, well, and, and being able to absorb what's going on in different cultures and and right now, like a sponge, I think you have to do that as an artist. I wanted to shift a little bit and talk about some of your. Well, I, I guess they're, they're series. They're also shows, but um, you've got the United States of Purple. You've got Nothing to See, and now uh, Black is a Color. Uh, it's almost like the trifecta. They work so well together, but also separately. I, I was really moved by all three of them, and I love this new one. Can you tell us a little bit? You can tell us about all three of them, or you can talk about Black is a Color, whatever you want to do. Yeah, sure. I, I think, I think um, the past... I guess I, I, I started in 2016 when Donald Trump became president and, and, and like the world changed. Like By the way, that's when I quit my job to be a full-time artist. I'd been doing it for 15 years and I was like, this is the year. And, and literally a day after I quit my job, Donald Trump was elected. And oh. I was like, oh, did I make the right decision? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> what happened here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <exactly. laughs> what happened? Um, you know, look, like, like uh, the world changed. It, it changed. It changed uh, as much as I can remember in my 49 years. Uh, the only other thing parallel was 9-11. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, that shift in the world was monumental. And I don't think that uh, any of us were prepared. And myself, who has a background in journalism and has a background, um, you know, has, has a lot of relationships with people in journalism and know a lot of know the integrity that it takes to be a, a good journalist. Mm-hmm. When Trump started attacking the media, that really inspired me because, you know, someone who, who, who learned all the ethos of what you have to do to be a journalist and how strict the standard is of a journalist about telling the truth and ensuring that you're always telling the truth. Right. When he attacked the media, you know, it just, it, I took that so personally um, and, and felt like so assaulted. And, and, and I started to look closely at, at everything he was saying and how aggressive and how, how dismantling that is to, to my children. I remember mm-hmm. them watching it and just being so confused about like, why are we watching the news? Is, is it, is the news real? Like what's going on? Like, cause they're kids, they don't, they can't process that, but they hear the leader of the free world who they're taught in school from the early age that the president is like the man, you know, the pledge of allegiance. And yeah, exactly. Like they, they still do that. Right. So there's this like paradigm of like watching our kids and everything. And so I created this nothing to see series, you know, out of that sort of like, Hey, let's visualize in a very simple way what this looks like to be to be censored or to have our rights stripped away or to have our to to, to have assault on one another be be okay mm-hmm. uh, and also about like how we're all okay with it like I, I was I was shocked that people weren't taking to the streets and and protesting um, we were just like in our phones and in our little world comfortable and rich and you know stock markets going up and the economy is getting better and people are okay well I mean I guess like censorship's okay I'll just stay on my phone. Um, I, I liken it to a, like our country to a drunk. Basically, you're not ready to change until you hit rock bottom, until it really affects you, you know, tangibly. That's when people will actually do that stuff. Which is black as a color. Yeah, so right, right, black right. Black as a color, right? Exactly. You know, like, so nothing to see happen. And then United States of Purple happen as, all right, well, hey, like, we're so divided right now are we ever going to find a middle ground? Right. That's the question. We, right. And, and that's what United States of purple was, was to look at visual division of humanity. Right. Mm-hmm. And looking at how people are turning away from their, their other, right. That mm-hmm. some people that think differently than them, there's a, this turn away. And so that's why like the heads are all sort of like looking away. Right. But then there's always these like seekers that are like peeking out and curious about what the other side was. That's one of the, the two of the images that are in there. Um, and, you know, it's this idea and this con- this visualization of the concept that like, can we find common ground? 
Mm -hmm. right? And can we find unity? Can we find that blend between red and blue, right? Can we right. find our purple, right? And so, and can we be united with such division, right? Can we truly be united when we're so divided, right? Mm -hmm. And so that 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 was like the very literal, right? But a literal visualization sometimes is very powerful. And like, remember, never under never underestimate the value of a well executed cliche, right? Like, yeah, exactly. Don't, don't forget that like simple, a simple portrait can change the world. Yes. In the right hands, it definitely can. Look at the Mona Lisa, right? Like, yeah, there's nothing more simple than that. But the smile has enamored people for centuries. Yes. So sometimes art, especially contemporary art, is like so complex that you, you can't even digest it. Yeah. Right? Well, if you need the art explained to you, if you need the artist to sit down and explain it to you, I always find the over intellectualization of art sometimes turns me off a bit because I mm -hmm. want to be able to see it and, and, and feel something when I, when I look at it, like what I see, right. when I look at your work, I feel something. And mm -hmm. then of course, when you talk about it, I understand more and there's more depth to it, but you have to have that initial kind of response. Right. And yeah. with some art, a lot of art, a lot of conceptual art too. I'm not, I'm not ragging on all conceptual art. I like some conceptual art, conceptual art, but if you have to have it explained to you first for you to have to make an impact, then there's something going wrong in my opinion. Yeah. A hundred percent. And then you, and you scratch your head, like how, but, but yeah, that can lead us in all kinds of directions. But then we hit rock bottom with um, the George Floyd. Oh yeah. I, I think, I think we can all say in our socially, like we hit rock bottom. We really, <laughs> Hey, uh, excuse me, Lindsay, can you help with this? Um, my dog knows that if I'm speaking on his <laughs> room, that if he bother, if he like interacts in that way, like that, I'll feed him to show. Oh, up. nice. That's, so, uh, so that's he's smart. Like, hey, maybe I'll bark and he'll feed me. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I apologize. He's, oh, yeah, don't even worry about it. We're not professional dog. here. Don't um, worry. These two dogs and they spend their day with me, but. Oh, that's um, cool. What kind of dogs? Two labs. Um, one's a chocolate and one's a um, what's called a, a silver lab. It uh -huh. looks like more like carbon, like a, more like oh, a cool. like a silver color, almost like a Weimaraner, but darker. But um, it's it's kind of like a not really recognized version of a lab. But I saw it and I was like, wow, this is a cool looking dog. I rescued it. So oh, nice. So I rescued la labs. We, we I, welcome I, dogs' noises. So. All right. So uh, you know, we hit rock bottom with with George Floyd, and and I, and I was so moved. Like just by, I didn't want to. I didn't want to go out and 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 be part of the you know the protest because that's not that's not my most powerful medium. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like my most my value to this world is is a visual storyteller um, and to put things into a visual way in which people can see them and feel them and 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 know them through the image um, as opposed to just being uh, another marcher on the street, not to discount the power and importance of that. But right. for, me, for me during that time when everybody was protesting and burning and, and really expressing themselves in, in, in that way, I was in the studio creating that work, a non-literal look at profiling and um, a non-literal look at racism mm -hmm. and our cultures, you know, we treat race as very binary. Yes. Right? Black or white. Yep. Right. Let's just start there. Right. But I've never seen a black person. The black is the color of your, your, your earphones. Right. <laughs> right. And have you right. ever seen a white person? Exactly. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. like, now that oversimplifies it and discounts and some people might find that offensive, but we're using it in very um, metaphor terms of saying like, why are we still having people check boxes of their race? What we saw in George Floyd was a, a protocol that was taken that murdered a human being oh because he was binarily bucketed as black. Right. Yes. And when we do this, we do that. And, you know, nothing, nothing moved me more than when we, in that Kenosha um, riots there, you know, shots are fired and, and chaos is happening. That guy, the, I forget his name. I, and I apologize for the insensitivity of the name, but the, I think it's Kyle Richardson or whatever mm -hmm. his name was like mm -hmm. um, 
he's seen like waving at the cops as they're coming in with his long rifle. Yeah. Like after having just killed two people. Yeah. If, if someone of African descent was in the same position, he would have been filled with 20 bullets. He would have been mowed right? down. He would have been mowed down. No question asked. And that's like profiling and bucketing and missing black as a color shows us what we miss in the individual mm-hmm. when we just see black. Yes. And we don't recognize the, the simplicity of that. Black is what you get when you mix all colors together. I right? love that. Yeah. I, I read that on some of your interviews. I thought that was really powerful. I love that statement. It's a hundred percent, you know, true. If we look at it that way, like let's look at black, not as a, as a, as a, as a racial profiling technique. Right. But let's, mm-hmm. Let's look at the beautiful nature of like all the wonderful things that that individual George Floyd provided to people in his community. And, and if you learned about him in any way, um, you, you learned that 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 he he added a lot of color to people's lives. Yes. Yeah. He was not perfect. Um, no, but, but nobody is. Nobody is. And and did he deserve to be murdered in broad daylight when many different other options were available? No, um, no. And if we had a broader perspective of the way that we saw individuals as non-binary, not only in genders, but also in race, that we our world would be very different. Oh, yeah. And, and, and I think you know, as an artist for the better. And that's mm-hmm. why I felt that I really I really think the images are beautiful in such a way that speak to like beautiful awareness and to speak, to remind you when you see them and hopefully if people, when people have them in their house and people do, when they look at them, they're inspired to think more inclusively. Yes. And think of, with more empathy and to look at one another, not as a threat, but as a contribution, mm-hmm. right? Like, can we as people look at someone and not be afraid but think this person can be an ally. This right. person can help me. This person I can help. And that is a general oversimplification. And I know that these are broad strokes. And I took all of this into consideration before I published this. And I was very hesitant about publishing it because I didn't want to, I didn't want this project to add fuel to the fire, or be misconstrued and taken the wrong way. And I wanted it to be really helpful. And I communicated with lots of my friends that were from African descent, um, mm-hmm. and talk to him about the title and talk to him about the project and share the images and the artist statement. And, and, and the response was a hundred percent positive. There wasn't oh, a that's great. person who said like, you're crazy. In fact, everybody that I showed and talked to was ecstatic about it. And the, from the models to the powerful creatives that are in my universe to athletes that I, that I work with on the professional level, Across the board, positive, and then and then that's why I felt like it needed to be shared, and and uh, thankfully it was it was received very positively without oh, yeah. any real trolling, and really, you know, really powerful and, and and really moving, and and I'm proud of the work. I'm proud of the that the energy and the anxiety of something so awful helps me create something beautiful that inspires people, and we just passed a year from this low point in our country, and I hope that we just don't forget. And it just doesn't become an afterthought and we move forward with more empathy and more compassion and towards others. And we stop looking at people and we stop approaching problems in a binary way when we're considering problems of race. I love it. I'm glad to hear that because I was, there's a part of me, I wanted to ask a question. I almost didn't even want to ask the question, but I was curious as to if you got any pushback being a white artist conveying this message and it sounds like you didn't no no i i I didn't i didn't at all and and i interact and i communicated with people that are very you know militant in that capacity that like and i said look like i want to be an ally right yeah right and if you and this is not just something that i just fell out of like you know, the moment and I just want to create something around this movement because there's energy around it. It's like, like my art has always been about being an ally and being empathetic and being about, um, 
you know, inclusiveness and understanding and, and compassion about others and different communities. In fact, I got a lot, of, I got, I got more pushback with people saying that, that there's nothing to see was blackface. Um, oh, when interesting. It, when it, you know, the, 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 the painted blackface, but mm-hmm. you know, the talent is actually, you know, African. Um, so if anything, it's, it's of African descent. So if anything, it's white face. Um, right. But, but, you know, that's not, you know, now, you know, th- these are conceptual representations, right? I'm, I'm representing humanity and concepts, not necessarily in that series, right? And so there was some of that, which, which I, you know, I just push aside as saying like, look, like you're missing the forest for the trees and I'm not going to give that any credence. Now, yes. on the other side, Good. black is a color. I haven't had any of that. And, you know, my goal is to always is to always empower and uplift and to be a positive voice for the future because I have children and, and I want them to, you know, live in a better place and to think broader. Yes. And your work's coming. It's, it's very human. It's coming from a place of empathy and outrage. I mean, how could anybody look at what happened with George Floyd and not be outraged? Um, So, and I like the quote, uh, I don't remember which article I read, but you were saying how your anxiety level wasn't high enough for you to create something yet about that. So is that, is that kind of something, is that a marker for you where you go, okay, my anxiety level has reached a high point now. This is something that I should be focusing on. Yeah. I I think anxiety always helps artists create, you know, I think. Maybe that's why I'm creating all the time. Right. (laughs) I I mean, I I think, I think anxiety is a weapon of the artist um, Mm -hmm. because it's the angst that, demands expression yes well it's physical too it's in your body it's just almost like begging to be let out a hundred harness that yeah i like that and, 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 right like that's super powerful right mm-hmm. like you know a, a lot of, a lot of great artists manage that anxiety with drugs and alcohol um, mm-hmm. as part of their their spiral of when they're off you know what i mean mm-hmm. and, but when they can channel it through expressive nature they, they a lot of times they create something brilliant i mean you look at jackson pollock right oh Great man example. yeah right like like his I know art, a lot about jackson pollock it's it's all about anxiety right it's it all, is it, it, and for me and not being able to harness that anxiety i mean well he did harness it in certain yeah. ways but he had yeah. so many demons from his past and it's such a if you read his story his history his family history there's a lot there that is just pushing out, you know, and, and when he's able to harness that for good, it's amazing. And then, it's amazing. and then right. he's got the times where he takes the ax to his brother's painting in a fit of rage, you know, uh, and that's, that's unchecked. Yeah. Right. It, it's unchecked, but it, and it ultimately leads to a spiral. So it's like that, it's that like channeling it towards that creative process. Yes. And, and I think you can't do that all the time. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, some people do, and they're very prolific and, and amazing. And, and they're superhumans out there. Let's just face it. Right. Like, I think like Banksy is like a superhuman. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or like if Banksy JR. is one person. I've got a friend who thinks it's not one person, but yeah. It could be. But I mean, like, just from the standpoint of like, that's like superhuman. Right. Yeah. Like Tom Brady is a superhuman. Right. Yes. Like, like, they're just on another level. And 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 I know this because I've interacted with a lot of superhumans through my commercial work. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like I, I got to photograph uh, George W. Bush and like I went in as a Democrat who hated him and thought he was a <laughs> fucking moron yeah, right. and walked out of the room like thinking he was my best friend. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, like Definitely. He was the superhuman and you don't get to be president of the United States by not being a superhuman. Like he manipulated me like from the get go. And he's charismatic. And I, like at such a level that I was like, I walked out of there and I was like, I just got con. Okay? <laughs> like, I just got completely con. Right. And, and, you know, there, are, and, you know, like I've worked with Tom Brady and I've worked in like, there's an aura around them. I'm not a superhuman. I'm just a guy who's, who's really like passionate about creating, but there are superhumans out there and those people can channel all the time. Right. And channel towards greatness all the time. But like mm-hmm. the us normal people, like we kind of waver back and forth between anxiety and, and, and disruption and then brilliance, the superhumans sort of lean towards the brilliance all the time. 
Elon Musk, right? He's a superhuman, right? Like Definitely. He's, a, he's, he's, a, he's a, like a savant and and his brain works differently, right? Like not Is it sustainable of, over time though, that superhuman ability or does it burn burn you out? I don't know. Some of these cats, like Elon Musk have been doing it for a long time from PayPal to- Tom Brady to, too. To Tesla from Tom Brady. It's just, I, you know, I think what people miss is that the human brain works differently for others. And they say like, oh, the humans only unlock 10% or 20% of their brain capacity. I forget what yeah. it is, right? But there's guys like Tom Brady who unlock like, you know, 50%, right? Because there's yeah. no way that you can achieve at that level. He's 44 years old or 45 years old or whatever. He's won seven Super Bowls. There's millions of kids every day trying to trying to take his job. Yeah. Right? Definitely. Younger, faster, stronger, whatever. But he's smart enough to execute while people are trying to kill him for the past 22 years. And I just use sports because it, we're just there. But, mm -hmm. you know, you can say the same thing about... Bansky or, or, or JR or any of these other, you know, really contemporary now artists that are executing like mind blowing things every day. Yeah. And, you know, we'd all like to achieve that, but there's only certain, there's certain people that I s truly believe are just better. Than well, and you've got that behind the scenes experience with some of those people. And I think it's so easy to hate people like that because they're just they seem omnipresent. You're seeing them and right. you're just like, oh, really? This person again? But you don't see what level you have to be working at to be able to sustain that for that many years and decades. It's uh, my, I, I'm not a big Tom Brady fan, but I really respect him yeah, completely. I, I'm not a fan at all. I hate him because I, I was like, let somebody else win, right? Yeah, but right, like, right. You know, and I'm tired. I like football. I give somebody else a chance, you know, so I root against him. But yeah, but, but I you can, can respect, respect it. Yeah. I can respect it. I think everybody can respect it with unquestionable, without a doubt, right? Yes. Like, without a doubt. But I think we all need to remember, though, that we're not that. Um, not all of us. Some of us are that. And mm -hmm. uh, But I know that I struggle uh, with a lot of things. And you asked me how I was doing. I'm not doing great. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, I have everything I could ever want. And I'm not doing great. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's real. And that prevents you from really executing all the time on a high level. And and I know I'll find my grade again. Like it's just right now, I'm just not there. And I, I'm self-aware enough to know, to not let that destroy me mm -hmm. and to try to seek, because I'm a seeker, try to seek solutions that will put me right back to where I need to be. Mm -hmm. And it's that anxiety of like, hey, I don't have enough anxiety right now to create um, what I need to create. It's a lot of that, right? Yeah. And, and that's like, and maybe that's because we're in a different place right now, right? Like it's such a transitory period. Like we're coming out of COVID. Uh, we have a new administration. You know, no one really knows what the new normal is going to be like because people aren't aren't back to work together and it's still like this partly remote thing and we're still there. And some of the world is still in the depths of COVID too. Yeah, right. yeah, a lot of the world, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? And so... California, where like I'm able to go to stores without masks on. Like I'm starting, yeah. you know, I went to I went to the U.S. Open, a major sporting event, and there wasn't one, one single mask. And it was like, all right, things are feeling kind of normal. The yeah, US Open was right down the street from my house, so I had, kind of had to go. Um, <laughs> and, and and you know, it's like those types of things. Like so, there's a transition period right now for me. Um, you know, the butterflies, like a metamorphosis. You know, like that. Like maybe that's why that's in there. But that really like flag in the stand burning, like I need to share this mm -hmm. is not there right now. And I think for me to create something really powerful and signature is not like, I don't have this hole in my chest. Like I did when I created black as a color. Right. Yeah. And, and I filled it with that art. And right now that hole's not there. Does that drive me crazy? Yes. Like that's why I'm not doing well is because I'm, I want, I want to create something moving. Mm -hmm. I want to create my next project, but what I don't want to do is devalue my great projects that I've put in the can by creating something just because I want to create. Yes. I really want to believe in what I create next. Of course. And I think, don't you think that's a natural progression? I think there needs to be a balance of, okay, you've given birth to this big, amazing series, not to mention all the stuff that's happened to you personally, everything that's happening in the world. I think we're all just kind of shell-shocked a little bit 
I think there needs to be a little bit of a processing time. I've been working through it and I've been able to find little spurts um, where I feel like I'm really creating well, but I also do feel that there's like a complacency or something. I don't know. It's weird. It's almost like the emotion. I can't feel anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah. A hundred percent. I know I'm still grieving. My father was my hero. Yeah. Um, that's and, horrible. And, um, I know I'm still grieving from that because, you know, he was a lot of why I, I was so, my desire for success was so great. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I, I felt like I was, I felt like I was honoring him. Um, hmm. And um, I felt like I was, you know, he, you know, my father was, was, uh, you know, high school dropout, grew up in the, you know, the Jewish slums in Baltimore and, and um, came from nothing, single mother, never, oh, had wow. a father, you know, never knew his father, you know, just like he, he did so much with so little, right. He truly, he truly was a, a heroic person for me. And I think, I think I'm still processing that and finding new purpose. Cause I think that there was a lot of purpose as a desire to um, do right by him. Really, mm. He gave me everything. Um, and I felt I needed to create a, a legacy to honor the name, so to speak. Wow. Well, that makes complete sense. You gotta, you gotta process that. I mean, the cool thing is your father got a chance to see you achieve some of this stuff too. Um, I, I mean, I'm assuming he got to see this trifecta we're talking about, all these great series, you being with uh, Avant Gallery, getting some good exposure, you know, getting a lot of press. I'm sure he was really proud of that. Yeah. I mean, like he, he was a photographer. Oh, really? So, yeah. So, oh, cool. uh, um, yeah. So, so even at that kind of, capacity is like this whole circle right Hmm. um and uh he was a very different kind of photographer he wasn't an artistic photographer he was an industrial photographer but you know he he uh when when he passed i went i had to you know i had to do all this stuff and go through all these things and i found a folder in with like his most prized possessions of clippings and articles about me um and emails him and um and emails that other people had written him about me and he never expressed any of that, you know, like, and, and, but then seeing that that was with him, um, you know, it was really powerful and, and moving for me. And, and yeah, and he thought I was the best thing in the world. And uh, that felt great to know that, that, you know, the approval was very high. That's amazing. It, it, but, but I think, but I think like when you have something that motivates you so much for so long, you know, not like, and then, and then that, that changes. That's a, that's a and throwing all the other disruption. You know, I think that that's very real, you know? Mm-hmm. So that happened in October, October 20, 28th, I think. Um, so it was a while ago, but I'm still thinking about it. That's a lot. That's a lot to process. But I think now the, the butterfly thing makes even more sense. Yeah. You know? I, I, I hope, I, you know, I hope people like it. It's, it's, I'm taking, um, I'm taking the concept of nothing to see and kind of adding a, a butterfly kind of effect in, in it, you know. Well, it's interesting too, because it's almost like your other series, I, I know the artist is always infused in their work completely. It's your voice, but it's almost like taking the focus a little bit out of something outside of yourself. That's uh, yeah, like a social exactly. message, a political message, and kind of bringing it a little bit more personal, which I think is, is uh, it makes sense. I think that is really insightful and I hadn't thought of it that way. And I think that that maybe that's more of what I need to do right now is, is really kind of express myself um, because I, I have used my art to express, you know, my feelings towards others or, or what's happening and being more socially uh, projective mm-hmm. and maybe my future is an internal expression. That's what I was seeing. I, it felt like this next series is going to be very personal. And, and I, I love that. That's great. Not, not to discount the other stuff. That's great. But I, I, I can see it going in that direction. Yeah, there, there is like a personal. Uh, and when now I start to see that some of the things that I'm doing in sketching and, and shoots that I've been doing are, are very expressive in that, in that um, personal space as opposed to a political space because I, or social place, because I just, there's nothing I'm saying right now. Right. There's not, there's nothing, you know, part of me wants to start to speak about environmental, um, uh, you know, the environmental destruction that is coming. 
um, yes. as a result of our lack of, of our complacency towards the reality. Um, it's a huge and, one for me too. And so there's part of me is like being motivated by that as I'm, you know, it's going to be 125 degrees in, in the Pacific Northwest this weekend, you know, it's like, insane. It's insanity. Right? Like, like we've ignored that completely <laughs> um, out of just sheer greed. Yeah. Right. And, and consumption. Like I have this concept about consumption that I'm, that I'm working on, but it's not very beautiful. It's very grotesque. And, and so part of me is like, sometimes art can, needs to be grotesque, but mm-hmm. people might not appreciate it. Right. It might not be as accessible. Well, but sometimes people will just like turn off when they see grotesque and as an artist what you really want them to do is is tune in mm-hmm. right and so you find that balance between like how do i express this how do i express our consumption right right like why are we in at a peril of global warming right because we consume the planet yeah and all of its resources right and burn all of its resources right well, there was a piece about on bill marley the night about almonds and how much oh water God. is being consumed by almond farming. Do we really need to give 80% of our water supply to growing almonds? Almonds. Have a, a like drought. A gallon of water per almond. That's what it takes per one single fucking almond is a gallon of it's water. It's insanity. It's, it's insanity. And I'm, I'm a plant, I have a plant-based diet. My wife and I are, and I can go without almonds. If you know, like yeah, you shift know it to it, something that takes a, li- a crop that takes a little less water. Right. And, and yet the almond lobby and, and power in California is, is overwhelming. And of course it will it never change. It'll it's never the same change. story. It's the same story. It's the, it's the same story. It's the same story is that money owns politics. Politics makes policy. Yes. Policy favors money. It's only going to change when there is no money. Or the rock bottom scenario, the drunkard scenario again. A hundred percent, right? We have so, zero water left. Right. Yeah. So that in that case, like that's something, you know, like that's accessible, right? Like there there could there could be a realization about almonds. Not many people know about that. I knew that about almonds. Yeah. Um, but not many people know that about almonds and, and about how consumptive they are. But like the vision of consumption is one of obesity, really. Sure. But also, don't you think that the almonds almost, they show the problem almost better than anything because it's just like, do we really need almonds? It's just, it's a very basic thing that we could do without. And we're like, la, 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 la. You know what I mean? Like, I want my almonds. I want my almond milk. I would rather have my almond milk. I can't see a world without almond milk, but, you know, we can have a drought for for the next decade. Well, I mean, and and it's, the absurdity of of our resource management is, um, is, you know, part of the problem, but it's yeah. like the fact that people, you know, consume a diet that is 50 times what they need to consume. Right. And then that, and then the healthcare system pays for it. We all pay for it. It's why my health insurance is like $40,000 a year for myself and my family. And, sure. and like, you know, it's, it's, it's madness. Right. Um, and, you know, we allow corporations like Burger King and, and McDonald's and, you know, to, to fill people with food that is killing them. Yeah. Right. Definitely. Um, and, and it's all those things like, you know, you walk into the grocery store, right. And there is like the good for you aisle, which is like your, your fruits and vegetables and your greens and your, and your all that shit. Right. And that's like, that's like literally like one tenth of the store. Oh yeah. And then it's rows of chips and rows of soda and roads of like packaged like candies. And like, that's like 40, 40% of the store. Yeah. Like, that's a simple illustration of like food ink, right? Mm-hmm. And all that stuff is poison. Of course. Poison, right? I could talk to you about this for days. I, I, I got really sick in my twenties and a lot of it was because of the food I was eating and I had to do a major lifestyle shift. And it's the best thing that ever happened to me. But it was kind of like the drunkard scenario. I hit rock bottom with my health. I was borderline suicidal because I was just so I, I couldn't couldn't process anything. I couldn't think. I had no energy. I was dizzy all the time. And I it was like a very long process of self-discovery. And once I got there, it was like a light bulb went off. And now there's no turning back. 
and now I see it so clearly with other people too. And, and what uh, was that food change? Well, a lot of it was I was eating a lot of processed food, a lot of sugar, and I was having, I couldn't figure it out. I was going to the doctor and they were like, you're healthy. There's nothing wrong with you. And I'm like, well, why can I not recall names of friends? Why am I dizzy at work? Why am I suicidal, basically? And then I finally, through a, a homeopathic, well, a friend who had had a friend who was a homeopathic doctor, she was like, did you, have you ever thought of looking up candida? And I was like, well, I don't know what that is. And I looked it up and the whole probiotic, you know, revolution, changing my diet, you know, uh, cutting out all the sugar from my diet, cutting out a lot of um, processed foods, a lot of, a lot of fast food, a lot of um, bread, a lot of carbs, um, and just changing my lifestyle, stopping drinking, quitting smoking. I was just doing a lot of bad stuff. Um, yeah. I was in my dark artist period and it took a long time. I got worse before I got better. And yeah. then a whole, like, it just was like a fog lifted and I got a book out of it and it was just, it was, it was beautiful. And I've, I've never been, I've never looked back. I'm, I'm healthier than I've ever been in my entire life. So. Oh, that's great. That's, it's that's, great. that's really positive. Like that's, that's really great. Like I, 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 I understand that diet and exercise and the importance of that for, for mind and body wellness um, yes. is very important to me. Um, and, but, I, but I, you know, the environment and, and what we're doing in the future, you know, cause I, I, have, I have two young children, right? Like, you know, yeah. chances are by the time this shit really hits the fan, you know, I'm, I'm going to be checking out. Right. Mm -hmm. But they'll just be at the stage of life that I'm in right now where they're, you know, raising families and, and, you know what I mean? And like, it's going to be gnarly, right? It's gonna be gnarly. It's like, it's going to be gnarly. And, and that, and that is, um, unless we change and change fast and like, it, it's so maybe that's my anxiety. Maybe that's my next series and solving and working around that stylistically i think it's important at this stage as an emerging artist to like not change styles so fast so that the work doesn't fit with the other work and mm -hmm. that's a challenge because like expressing all these concepts with similar construct is uh you know solving that and 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 and, and I, I have i have some ideas um but I, I'm really enamored with the the simple mankind mannequin esque interpretation. I was really enamored by that. I love it. I'm so I'm so excited that you said mannequin because when I first saw your work, I was like, "Are these mannequins?" And there is. I know there's a lot of. I, I've read a lot about it. I know you employ a lot of models that have alopecia, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so and and you're stripping down a lot of you know differentiating human features, which I think is really great but it almost has your work has like a, a sci-fi feel to it too sometimes i'm looking at some of it like almost like a cyborg type uh feel to it which i thought was really interesting and and you could go dark with that too i mean i know you do go dark but you I go dark you go dark and i love that um from a political standpoint but almost what's it what's the um wow what's the uh the term for the future that's a bleak future dystopian, dystopian thank you there's a dystopian angle to some of the stuff that i see too a hundred percent that this is really inspiring because like like seeing that you know it's it, it's really it's really important for artists to hear other people's view of their work because yeah. we project our own feeling on it and i'll be the first one who who criticizes it the sophomoric nature of it as an artist because mm -hmm. of i've seen that transition in my work you know what i mean like sure like when I look, I have all my portfolios I've ever had, right? And I'll open some of those portfolios that are the first portfolios from time to time and look at it and see the progression of my work from then to where it is now. And you realize that at the time it might've been cutting edge and relevant, mm -hmm. but does it hold up through the your, through your future? You know what I mean? Like, right. And I think that some of it does really well and some of it doesn't. Right. And so recognizing that what is sophomoric and what is powerful and enduring is, is, is really power, really necessary for an artist to take stock in. And, and I think that when other people see the, the nuance like that of dystopian and the, and the mannequins and stuff like that's intentional in order to make it to be relatable to the most people. Right. Because yeah. we as humans, tend to see ourselves in the subjects, 
right? Mm -hmm. And if we don't see ourselves in the subjects, it's unrelatable, right? It's the same with watching a movie. You know, you want to feel connected to the protagonist. Exactly. But if we strip away all of that and just make it relatable to everybody is human form, mm -hmm. right? And we, and we relate it to that as simple as like, I am a human. Then can we then see more of ourselves or project our own situation into that? And when I originally made these, I made them at scale because I, I wanted at a viewing distance to feel one to one, mm -hmm. right? Into human scale. So if you look at this image at the right distance, which, you know, I feel like it's like, it, it feels like scale, right? Yes. So you feel the hands on you. Definitely. Right? course you can walk up right close to it but if you go back to absorb it it's one to one mm -hmm. um, and so that making it relatable at that level is was really important to me and, and i'm just enamored with just stripping it down and i'm just enamored with making it relatable to everybody regardless of hair and eye color and skin tone and those types of things like that I don't know. There's something really powerful about that. And the process is really difficult. So it, it's hard to do and it's hard to do well. So it, it makes it have value in that in and of itself. Well, you can see just with like the base coat, just getting that kind of foundation down with the person that there's a lot of effort that's going into that before you're even starting with the other stuff. And I think that's really cool. I, I wanted to talk very quickly because I, I've got a couple rapid fire type questions that I want to ask you, but I like, um, I was struck with this new series, Black is a Color, with the models. And I know there's been a lot said about the uncomfortability of the models, you know, yeah. and I know, I know you were very aware of that and you took steps to make sure that everybody was safe. But I'm interested in the fact that like, first of all, you got this base coat of paint on, almost like an airbrushing, right? And then you're pouring another coat of like a black base right uh, yep. on top of that and then you almost got this like fluid i don't know if you used acrylic but it's like almost like a fluid oh. acrylic that you're dumping on top of them which is amazing and visually stunning but also there's a another layer of it which is that must have been hard to breathe and it must have been uncomfortable for some of the models and taking that a step further did that add to what you were trying to kind of convey as a, mm -hmm. as a message yeah, there's a there's an uncomfortableness in the posing in yes. and of itself that comes across in the work. That there's a tension. Well, it's like a beauty and uncomfortability. Yeah, yeah. There's a tension, right? Like there's a, like there truly is a tension in it, and that is and there's a lot of imperfection in it. Mm -hmm. um, which the challenge is is a lot of artists now are taking my work and making it in CGI. You know what I mean? Like three D renders. Like you could do that. Right? Yeah. But what you miss in that is you miss the imperfect perfect, right? Mm -hmm. And and you just can't do that in in in, in um, CG, right? It just ultimately feels like CG because it's like too perfect. It's right? too perfect, like, yeah. Because it's modeled, right? It's like algorithmic. Mm -hmm. So in, in in black is a color, right? Like each one is unique because it truly was a moment in time when things were imperfectly perfect, right? And so there's a there's that to it. The models were covered in a in a black acrylic, like, and and a certain thickness to that acrylic. So that was mixed a certain way to be a base, right? Yes. And then the other color was mixed. The other colors were mixed a different way to be to to run to to mix themselves. So that was a challenge along the way. We shot the fluidity that would like evolve as it's being. Pour down exactly. I mean, yeah. we, it, it took like five iterate five days of iterating with color to find it, right? Oh wow! Really get it. And, and each day has its own, you know, beauty and moniker along the way. So it's it, it truly is like there's a lot of discovery in that. And then there's like, okay, we went too far, you know what I mean? And then like we dial back, and you know, so it was really it was really um it was really a process. But the talent, the models, the the contributors, it, like there's a lot of like, okay, here's how you do it. You know what I mean? Like, and, and here's what's needed. And then first and foremost is, is that this is just a picture, right? Your health and safety is paramount. So when you need a break, right. all you do, you don't wait for me, you just stop. Right. And then we had a whole team of people that were like wiping people off and stuff and just like, you know, getting, getting them off. And, you know, it, 
they, when it first started, when they first, they would sit down for about two hour sessions. Mm-hmm. And the first like 15 minutes was very disruptive. Yes. Right? And then they would all settle into a, a, a Zen like state. Mm-hmm. And then, and then there was a consistency. And then there was this uncomfortable state where they were reaching their limit. Yes. And you could tell that. And so they're, they're each throughout that process. There's different imagery. There's images that are very like, you can see the disruption and then you can also see the peace and then you can see the disruption again. So yeah, it, created, it, it, it was really hard to edit this series because I edited it down to like 25 images, but there's probably 50 to a hundred images that are equally as good that you'll never see that are just amazing. But it's just like, I'm sure so much, you but know? you've got a cool, uh, you know, body work there for like a retrospective, you know, down the road stuff that's never been seen. But yes. I also wanted to say, it, it, it reminds me a little bit, have you seen the movie The Abyss? I have, yeah. With Ed Harris. I know, it's kind of random. But you know, there's a part where they're getting them that liquid where they can breathe underwater. Yes. And yes. they're feeding it to him. And there's a moment yes. where he's like panicking and he's like, oh, yes. I'm drowning. But then he lets go and surrenders and lets it in. Right. And, they're, and then they find a kind of a piece in that. That's what yes. it kind of reminded me. Of, but also, was there any sort of intentional, were you trying to say anything about George Floyd in that as well, as far as not like being able to breathe. breathe. Yeah. Yeah. Like I can't breathe. Um, you know, there, there was intentional posing in that way. You know, one of the, there's a, there's an image called Floyd, right. And it's like the back of a neck and like Mm -hmm. this colorful, you know, this like human from the back kind of like three quarters, like looking over his shoulder, kind of the way that there was this image in my head when, when I saw the footage of him kind of like reaching over, looking over his shoulder to yes. like, to like to be like, I can't breathe. Talk you know? to him. Yeah. Exactly. And that's kind of the shot. Um, and, oh, wow. and it's very much like that, you know, the, the literal, I can't breathe. I think you see and feel that in the tension of some of the talent. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but that wasn't like, Oh, I'm intentionally suffocating these people. Sure. Sure. Um, sure. Yeah, no, you, that might have been too on the nose, but yeah. Yeah, that's that was that was that was an unintended consequence that I think people see in the work that mm-hmm. it's relevant and accurate, um, but it wasn't planned. Um, but the posing was planned. Well, that's what great art does. I think is you discover stuff after you've made it, right? It's out there in the world. People are seeing it, and then they go, "Oh, this is." I see this in this piece and you're like, Oh yeah, I guess that's in there. I wasn't really intending to put that in there, but it takes on a life of its own a little bit. A hundred percent. Which is great. I I, you got, I got, you know, like when you're, when you're editing this, like I find like a lot of, um, and when I say editing is like looking at the take of 3000 images and finding the story out of 20 or 25. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you're going through this process and you're picking images that say different things, right? And that's when the story comes together, right? Like when you put them all together. Yes. And 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 you're like, okay, like this is the story. Um, these are the story. This is the story I want to tell. You can, as an artist, go into the shoot with a certain intent, but when you see the story come together then it really becomes a body of work that is representational of a concept because you're as the artist choosing all that work, right? Yes. And what you see and what, you, and how you see it. And so I think that, I mean, I literally like, I sat with that edit for six weeks. Like mm-hmm. I looked at it every day for six weeks, like before I felt it. Right. And that, and that process was in and of itself is the worst process. Like, oh yeah. The editing process is like, the worst, like I loathe it, but you got it. You got to get through it. Like I, and that's like <laughs> that project in October, like the talent was like, when am I going to see pictures? And I'm like, honestly, like I just lost my father, like two weeks after the shoot, I can't deal with the, what I'm saying with these images. It's going to be a while. And yeah. Like, okay. I get, I get it. <laughs> Hopefully. But yeah, it's weird. It's editing. The editing process is always the most painful process, but it's so crucial in every way, even with this podcast, the editing process is so sometimes it can just be a pain in the ass, but it can make or break the flow of a, of an episode, you know? Yeah. Without a doubt, people don't understand that part of the art, you know what I mean? Like that, how those choices that you make um, after the fact are everything. 
Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, my favorite category in the Oscars is the editing category. And people don't, people are like, why? And I'm like, because that's where the story is found. Like, well, I've heard story, stories. stories that have gone so many other ways. Definitely. Well, I mean, I even hate to bring it up now, Woody Allen, but um, even with Annie Hall, there was like three and a half hours of footage. It was supposed to be like a drama, apparently. And they cut that thing down into a comedy. But also I've heard so many times of, of actors not giving a great performance and just being saved in the editing room or even like getting an Oscar based on the edit. <laughs> you know what I mean? So if you didn't think editing was important, it, it is. It is. It, it, it truly is. And, you know, it's, that's where like as you know being a painter like mm -hmm. how is that that process must be incredibly difficult because like there's not a lot of edit <laughs> you know what i mean and it's, there's a lot of surrender yeah right? yeah like, there's a well, lot I, of surrender. I think what it is is that it's a lot of it is just getting to a point where you what i do is i start out 80 percent of the time i start out unhappy with a piece and then I just like a working through it period, like especially with oils, because you can work with them wet. And it's not that kind of pressure for it to dry too fast with, like, with acrylics. I love acrylics too, but but with an oil painting, I don't know how many times I've been this close to scrapping the painting. And then I'm just like, no, I'm going to keep going. The stubbornness in me kicks in and I end up creating a piece that ends up being one of my favorite pieces. And that's because I just didn't, I, maybe I was overthinking it too much. And then I let something in the moment, that part of your brain where you're criticizing too much or or overthinking it goes away. And then you get into that flow state where something beautiful comes out of it. And it doesn't always happen, but it's great when it does. I can relate to that. That That's the, cause I, cause I'll, I'll like this project that I'm, that I just finished that I shot in October is like, I looked at those images in Photoshop and like pulled them out and put different treatments on them a hundred times. Mm -hmm. um, and noodled and noodled and was about to just give up and move on when I, when I found and saw what I wanted to say. Yeah. Well, yeah. And in, in any medium you have the happy accident and you have the ability to, you know, discover something deep into the process. I think everything's, I mean, photography and painting are very different, but there's, there's a kind of unifying element to, uh, I think all, all art, all fine art. Re remember when people thought photography was going to kill the painting? <laughs> why would yeah. you need to paint you just take a picture of yeah it. you don't need you it don't need well it's the right. same with the movie my dad was in the movie business and they always thought oh video rental is going to kill the movie business and then it was like you know digital stuff and dvds and then streaming and it, it, it still hasn't so right. um, if anything it's gotten better it's gotten yeah. better well yeah. i i want to be a little mindful of your time and i want to get into just a couple quick rapid fire questions that i ask a lot of people i want to ask you everyone because i think you've answered some of them already which is great because i didn't have to ask you it came up organically but um i always ask people like what their superpower is as an artist how do you create when you're not feeling it and i think you kind of answered that a little bit already but but i was just wondering if there was anything else that came up uh superpower as an artist i think i would say my use of color is probably my superpower as an artist you know mm -hmm. like like i make really good instinctive color choices and uh and and use of color in a bold way that I think even in my from my commercial work on like it, people always think of me um, when they think of color and bold use of color and and it's like it's such a part of of me now as like creatability it's probably my anxiety right like, mm -hmm. like my drive through my anxiousness um, being able to like really be anxious about expressing something yes and needing to express it and being able to be relentless about solving the problem mm -hmm. and, and you know thinking about it until until i've solved it um, yes i think that's a special skill for me that not many people have is that like when my mind locks in there is nothing that's going to stop me from making it happen problem is is it doesn't lock in as much as tom brady's does <laughs> Well, not everybody can lock in like Tom, Tommy, exactly. Tommy Brady. Well, yeah. And that was something we did talk about earlier, the anxiety, but I think that is a beautiful superpower. The awareness that the anxiety is, so, there's something there that can be yeah. harnessed because I think a lot of people let anxiety be debilitating and it, it completely cripples them. Whereas it, if you just turn the corner, it can maybe be something you can harness, which, so that, that's great. It's a, it's a little, it's a little bit of the bipolar, right? Like, mm -hmm. like, 
you know, the propensity to create in manic states of explosive creative energy. Yeah. Um, and then to not let the down that follows it, like destroy you. Yeah. And to be self-aware enough to be like, oh, I'm self-aware, like, hey, I'm in this creative expansion and I'm going to put everything into it. And then when the obvious, you know, downside of it hits, I'm going to be aware that this is where I am and that I'm not going to let it destroy me and, and, and accept it and understand that I'll be okay. Yes. And, and on, on a broader scale, I think that might be what's going on with you in your career. You know, you're just, you're having that other side is being turned, you know, the downside where you just need 100%. to get through this period to get back, back into it. So another one is uh, advice. I love this one because it's really advice to everybody, but advice to young Tim, any age, something that looking back all the things you've learned through your career, uh, what would you impart upon your young self? Yeah. Um, that this is such a good question because like, would I have, would I be who I am now had I had that advice? Right. Know. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Because because I have to, I wouldn't trade anything for where I am now, right? Mm -hmm. Because I, I never dreamt this far, never dreamt that, that I would have what I have. Mm -hmm. um, and I wouldn't want to give any of it back. And so, if you changed uh, it, maybe you would. Maybe you would. Yeah. yeah things about me that I wish were different that maybe saying something to would be better, would be like get help sooner mm -hmm. and, and um, seek, be self-aware of what, of why you feel this way mm -hmm. and that, and recognize that not everybody feels this way. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right? That, yeah. That, that you're unique in that, um, in the way that you are. And, that is okay. Yes. I like right? that. Yeah. And so that in that capacity, I think that, you know, it took me a long time to figure out that not everybody dealt with the things I deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, um, and that not everybody perceives everything the way that I perceive them. That's a big moment, not only in life, but in your career is, is that recognizing that other people objectively have a different experience and they have a different filter through how they you know, perceive the world and art. A hundred percent. And so I think it's, I, I, I don't know if that's, I don't know why that is, but like, and I, and, I, and I'm definitely unique, right? Like I'm mm -hmm. definitely on that spectrum of I'm different. Yeah. Right? And, you know, maybe that's the artistic, you know, like you want to, when we go all the way back to the end of this conversation, like, Oh, I was never that artistic kid, but maybe I was. Maybe you were. Yeah. Oh, you know that's great. I mean? And maybe this was all, it was all part of the plan. Well, yeah, it's just, it's just, you know, it's just like, oh, now, now I'm in my lane. You know what I mean? Yes. It, takes, it takes a while for you to find your lane sometimes. If I found my lane earlier, would I be in a better situation? Maybe, but I might not. And I'm really happy with where I am. I think that's beautiful. And I think that's something that I keep getting from people is this thread of, because I ask about biggest failures and things like that, what things you've learned from. And everybody ends up saying, I would not trade anything for the way. And maybe it's because of the people that I'm interviewing, right? People who are having some sort of artistic success or, or whatnot. But yeah, it makes us who we are. My decade plus dark struggle made me who I am. And now I wouldn't trade it for the world. In the moment, I hated it. And I was tearing my hair out, but it made me who I am. So I, I completely relate to that. Where do you see, what's, what's a goal that you have with your, what's, what's the next, I know you're in a period right now where it's kind of hard to maybe that, envision that. that goal's clear, right? The goal is clear. The okay. goal is the, the goal is to, is to make more work like this and have it on the walls of people that appreciate it and appreciate the work and to, and to truly enter that scene and market with bigger networks and bigger communications and bigger partnerships and bigger um, meet more people. You know, we haven't been able to do that in, in COVID, like press more palms, like share more people, learn, 
you know, collaborate with other artists, meet other artists like yourself, like, yeah. like, like become invested in that community is, is my goal. You know, like I'm established and known in this, this advertising community and in this industry and I, and I'm, and that's been great, but I want, I want this, like, this is, this is my future. This is what I see myself doing in the three to five year window, like transitioning from one position to another and making this like everything that I do moving forward. And that this is what you see and people know me for that. Um, that's my future. That's my goal is to really embrace the art world and the community that it is and the people mm -hmm. in it and to really become part of it, you know, as a commitment. And, um, and, and I hope that the success continues and I hope to meet more people and to learn more and to become more knowledgeable and to add depth to my work through that community. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and hopefully I can give back to that community um, in some way along the way. Yes. Well, and you're definitely on that path. So it's, it's cool to see the evolution and I'm, I'm excited to see where you go with it. I wanted to ask you, well, one question I meant to ask you earlier, do, do you know Chase Jarvis by any chance? I do know Chase. Chase and I do know each other. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I figured you might. You guys, I knew you kind of play, uh, swam in the same waters a little bit, no. so. Okay, cool. Yeah, he's, uh, he was somebody that, um, you know, back in the day, I, I got a little inspiration from as far as like from a podcasting standpoint, Creative Live. And I just thought maybe you know. So cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> I was on Creative Live. I was, oh, you were? Uh, oh, nice. I was. And I, and I, um, I just did a clubhouse with Chase like, I don't know, a month and a half ago, two months ago. Um, oh, really? Oh, so, yeah. And, and then we, we had, um, I met him, physically met him when we we both spoke at a polaroid booth at uh, ces at, Com at the consumer electronics show in vegas mm -hmm. um, and so we got to go out to dinner through that and um, got to know him a little bit on the personal level through that and then um and then over the years we've crossed paths through that of course oh that's very cool yeah he's a he's a cool guy so is there anything that you want to talk about something that i left out you feel like is very important to talk about or to plug or anything. I know we've we've talked quite a bit, but yeah, I think I think probably what I what I would say is that you know anybody listening to this that that um, is frustrated or anxious or or is struggling to remember to be patient, mm. um, and that uh, an overnight success sometimes takes twenty years, yeah, um, and, or more, uh, yeah, or more, um, and that you know seek others, seek the help of others. Mm -hmm understand that that a lot of people probably feel the exact way that you do and that it's okay um, yes to, to keep keep taking small steps every day no matter how small that step is it's still a step forward um and try to take that step even if it is just small because over time the distance that you will travel will be remarkable but if you don't move in any capacity you won't accomplish anything so no matter how small you, you can make that step, no matter how much you're struggling, you know, you'll make a step. Some days you'll, you'll run marathons and other days you'll just get out of bed. Yeah. But continue to move forward towards that. Um, I think that, that, that would be something that I'd, I'd want to share. With people. I love that. And, uh, and that, you know, getting rejected, getting rejected, that's not even a word, getting rejected or having some sort of perceived failure is a step. And it's progress yeah. too, and it's necessary yeah. towards you uh, eventually, whatever succeeding, whatever that means to you. Um, 100%. Yeah, I've I heard no more than I've heard yes for sure. Yeah. Oh my God, me too. Tell me about it. Yeah, for it's sure. great. I, I've gotten to the point where I, I I love it now. Like when I get a no, ah, it's like uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I think <laughs> I, being self aware. I think I think the best thing I ever ever learned. I spent a lot of time learning to be self aware. Mm -hmm. you, know, you might not like being self-aware. There's a lot of things that I don't like about myself and I wish I could change, but I can't, right? Like that's just who I am, right? Like I can't change. I can change some things. I can be aware of those things and how it affects others. But my instincts are, have always remained the same. And my instincts have gotten me to my dreams and I don't want to vanish them or vanquish them because they've gotten me here. Yes. And I know with time and patience, they'll get me even further. 
I love it. Well, I can say I really love your work. It, it really, when I, when I first, I, I can't believe I've never seen it before, but when I was exposed to it, I was, I had an immediate reaction. So I know everybody else who's listening to this is also going to love your work. It's uh, Tim Tatter. Where can people find you? I love the alliteration of your name too, by the way. <laughs> Tim Tatter. Uh, <laughs> awesome. But uh, where can people find you online? You know, the, you know, just a simple Google search will we'll find a plethora of information. My website, um, you'll find first my commercial website, which is just timtatter.com because mm-hmm. of its, its um, you know, it's, it's, it's been there for a long time. And then I have a timtatter.art, um, mm-hmm. which is like the strictly only art site, um, which just basically at this time just has the trilogy and the artist statements around the trilogy. You'll find those, they both link to each other. So, or I mean, the commercial links to the art. So as long as you just, Tim Tatter on Google, you'll find me. It's Tatter spelled with two D's. It's like ladder, but with a T at the front. Um, yes. But you even find it if you use two. A lot of people do two T's, but it's two D's. And just Google me and you'll you'll find lots of really amazing information that is out there. People have um, said really nice things about me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, so got some really that. good press. I, I loved it. So yeah, it's funny. I was talking to—I can't remember who I was talking to—but they said, asked them where they could, what their website was, and they said, "My website is www.google.com." <laughs> so I think that I think that works for you too. You you come up this, right away. This guy right here, Peter Strongwater, who was the who was this this photographer, like you know, I never forget. Rest, I hope he rests in peace. But I'll never forget him. One time when I was first like this hotshot young photographer, and I was like thought I was the biggest, greatest thing since sliced bread. And <laughs> here's this old dude with these big Coke bottle glasses and this New York society accent. Uh-huh. And, and I, and I was, and somebody said, yeah, I was a photographer. And I was like, I was like, Peter, you're a photographer. Where can I find your work? And he goes, Google me, baby. Just Google. Me. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's and just Google open me, your baby. eyes, baby. You'll, you'll find me. Oh my God. I love that. Well, Tim, it's really been fun talking to you, getting to know you. I love your work. I'm going to keep following it. Stick around for a minute, but uh, we'll say goodbye to everybody here. But everybody check out Tim Tatter's work. It's amazing. I think you'll really be moved by it. So thanks for coming on. Thank you, Preston. Appreciate it for having me. And, and um, great talk. It was really inspiring. Thanks so much. This has been the Living Artist Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. I just want you to know that I appreciate you being here, and I'm grateful to be in your ears. Your art and creative life on this planet is meaningful, so thank you for sharing it with me. If you like this podcast, whatever platform you're listening to it on, please subscribe and share it with your friends. You can also leave me a positive review to show your support. This helps me to reach more people with the algorithmic magic and keep the show going strong. If you want to see more of what I do and check out the art that I create, you can visit my website at www.pmsartwork.com or follow me on social media everywhere at PMS Artwork. That's it for now. See you back here next time.